Ephesians chapter 2. As we continue to note the uh, book of Ephesians in chapter 2, we are in verse 5 and uh, just about to finish that. Actually, we will uh, uh, finish uh, the doctrine that's going to wrap up verse 5, then we'll get into verse 6 on Tuesday. Uh, But ultimately, we continue to talk about our positional relocation. We were born spiritually dead. Now we have been given spiritual life, and now we are spiritually alive. And as it says at the end of verse 5, by grace you have been saved. And so as we've been noting these first five verses, we've been talking about how grace found us. And grace found us in a dead, rotten, wretched place, again, spiritually dead and filled with our sins, ultimately under the control of Satan and his cosmic system and our sin nature. And all our ways of thinking and doing ultimately were according to the world system rather than according to the grace and love of God. But God found us in that wretched place, but he didn't just leave us there. He did something about it. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. And again, that's why we celebrate it during this holiday season, ultimately celebrating the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I love how we have this uh, set up here with the crash uh, to my left, and then right behind it we have the cross because that's what it's all about. He came as a baby boy. He came to take on humanity. So ultimately he could go to the cross and pay the penalty for for our sins, which he did, and now through him we have eternal life. We've been taken from that spiritually dead state and made spiritually alive through our non-meritorious act of faith in him. So let's just read these verses real quick, and then we'll get into the uh, doctrine and lesson for this morning, and then I've got something uh, to go along with this for our communion service. But it says in verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and again, that's Satan, uh, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and that's our old sin nature and how we gave into it. And were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And as Satan has been condemned to the eternal lake of fire because his ultimate rejection of God and whatever that saving plan was for him, mankind who rejects Jesus Christ is also condemned to the eternal lake of fire as a result. Now in verse 4 it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So once again, we see that the love of God came into our life, the mercy of God came into our life, ultimately fulfilling itself by the grace of God that has come to us. And we noted the doctrine of efficacious grace last week where we talked about the ministry of God the Holy Spirit to take our non-meritorious faith and make it effective for our salvation. And when we believe in the cross of Jesus Christ, then ultimately we receive salvation due to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, this morning, as which we also kicked off on Thursday night, I wanted to talk to you not just about efficacious grace, the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, but God's overall grace and how His grace is functioning and operating in our lives and how His grace came into our lives for our salvation. And as I just read to you, remember, the love of God is expressed here. Grace is the expression of God's love. God's love on itself cannot do anything by itself because His righteousness and His justice have to be satisfied because He is a holy God. But because of His righteousness and justice being satisfied in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, ultimately now His love can be expressed to us when the grace of God comes to us and brings us salvation. And remember as it said, for God so loved us with His great love. And that's when we were dead in our transgressions. Now remember, every member of the human race is dead or comes into this world dead in their transgressions or dead in sin, as we would say. So that means that God loved the whole world. Again, Jesus Christ went to the cross for every member of the human race, not just the believer. But the believer ultimately has received that grace of God by believing in Jesus Christ and then ultimately receiving salvation within their own life. So when we talk about grace, remember it's all that God is free to do for man, for mankind, especially the unbeliever, but also the believer as well. And it's based on the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as I said, he came in the manger as we have. And you know the story. It's found throughout Scripture. He was born in that lowest of places, in a, in a barn, in a stall where the animals would be, really signifying the humility that he brought on when he came into this world. 
Again, it was humili uh, humili hum humiliating enough. Got to get my right humil in ending with it. But it was humiliating. Humili <laughs> oh, I can't even say it this morning. Doom. Okay. Humiliating enough. I got to slow down. That's what I usually do. It was humiliating. <laughs> I love it. You know what I mean. Okay. It was enough just to take on humanity, okay? Just to take on humanity. Because he was God, and he took on humanity. But that humanity also humiliated itself to be even born in a lower place where the next lowest creation called the animal kingdom would reside. And that's how Jesus Christ came into this world. Again, as a lowly individual, without his glory and without his majesty and without all of that, even though as he was born, as we read in Scripture, the angels were proclaiming his majesty and the angels were singing to his glory at his birth, he came down physically in that lowly state of being born in a manger. He took on humanity for the entire world. And that's why, again, as we uh, celebrate this, and as you know, we celebrate Christmas, and you know, he wasn't born during this time, and the Bible doesn't give us the time in which he was born, and it doesn't even command us to celebrate his birth, okay? But we have adopted that, and we do that because we are praising our Lord. We're praising the coming of our Lord. We're praising that he took on humanity so ultimately he could go to the cross. And that's why we celebrate Resurrection Sunday as well, to celebrate these things that Jesus Christ did for us. And as I said, he came down in a lowly state, and what were the angels doing at that time? They were singing praise and glory. And as we sing our songs, on, you know, as we lead up to this Christmas, again, whether you believe in the Christmas celebration or not, you should be singing praise to the Lord and praising Him for coming in His humanity, praising that He came and took on that humanity so that He could go to the cross and die for our sins. And that's why we do it. That's why we sing all of our songs in praise and worship of Him. And these Christmas songs, as we call it, are just singing about His birth. So again, praise Him as we all did this morning, okay? Sing out, sing it out. Because when you get to heaven, you're going to be praising Him over and over and over again. <clears throat> and we're going to be singing all kinds of songs to Him in the eternal state when we are in our perfected state. But just think about now when you're not in a perfected state and you still are operating and have a sin nature that is uh, functioning within your life saying, don't do this and don't do that in your worship of God. Now you have an opportunity uniquely to overcome all of that and praise Him to the hilt. And we do that because of the grace of God. The grace of God has come into our lives. And the grace of God, again, is based on the cross of Jesus Christ, where he died for our sins. It also, this word propitiation that we talk about, it talks about reconciliation, conciliation, drawing us near to God because God was satisfied with the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. You see, the grace of God has come into our lives, and because God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. And remember, this all depends on who and what God is. Again, grace doesn't depend on us. We've just read what we were, dead in our sins, operating in transgressions, under the kingdom of Satan and his cosmic system, giving over to the desires and the lusts of our flesh, the, the temptations from our old sin nature. That's how we were wasn't anything lovable in that whatsoever. But the love of God, by the grace of God, came into our lives and ultimately uh, brought everything to us because of who and what He is. Because of His righteousness, His justice, His love, His mercy, His grace, all those things that we've seen. But His sovereignty, His immutability, His all-powerfulness, all-knowingness, His truthfulness, did I say that yet? And His uh, unchanging nature. All of those things that make up who and what God is, that He is holy and righteous and justice, but He is love and merciful and gracious. That's who He is. That's our God. And He's done the most that He can absolutely do for us. And so it's an occupational hazard, and I kind of use these, these professional type of words because I've said to you before, remember, we are professional Christians. That's our profession. You are a new heavenly citizen. You are an ambassador for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are a royal priest. All of those things are professions. We have ambassadors for our country, right? That's a profession. We have priests serving in our churches, that, you know, what we call priests. We have them serving in our churches. That's a profession called the ministry. But guess what? All of us are royal ambassadors and all of us are royal priests. And we have a profession. And our profession is called Christianity. And we're here to do what? Proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ. 
to live it in our lives and proclaim it to a lost and dying world. And so we have a profession that we need to function in and operate in each and every day. And the occupational hazard for believers is to forget about or to ignore the grace of God and to, under, and to not understand what grace is and to not apply it within our lives. It's an occupational hazard. In other words, it's detrimental to our daily lives and our daily walk. And the majority of our sin that we commit is due to forgetting about God's grace within our lives. Everything that He does for us and everything that He will do for us. And all the provisions that He's given to us. Again, we've been saved by grace. We know that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is going to note that. But our daily walk is also by the grace of God because the Word of God has been given to us to empower and strengthen our lives, to give us wisdom and understanding and discernment. Uh, the Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we can apply that Word in our daily lives, learn it, and then apply it on a consistent basis. Prayer has been given to us so that ultimately we can seek out our God in time of need and turn things over to Him and ask Him for His guidance in the application of His Word to go forward each and every day. But when we forget about the grace of God or we ignore the grace concepts of God within our lives and all that He has done, that's when we get into trouble. That's when we cause problems, that's when we enter into sin, and that's when uh, problems start to occur within our lives. Again, it leads to all kinds of disorientation. And as we said, it even leads to reversionism as well. And in Galatians 5.4 and Hebrews 12.15, we understand that. In Galatians 5.4, remember we studied this uh, in, uh, about uh, this past year in studying the book of Galatians. It says, you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. And remember, Paul was talking to a group of people that had already accepted the grace of God and received salvation within their lives. And now what they did is they forgot about the grace of God and grace provisions, and then they went back to a system of, I've got to save myself, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. And they went back to the law, as you know, and as the false doctrines came in, it wasn't just believe in Christ and then continue to uh, rely on the grace of God in their lives. It was a system of rituals of do's and don'ts. And as I said to you on uh, uh, Thursday night, you know, even though we consider ourselves a grace church, again, we're called Grace Fellowship Church because that's the tenet of our church. We want to understand the grace of God and the fellowship that we have with the Holy Spirit on a day in and day out basis. But even in a grace church like ours, we can become legalistic. And we can come and start to get in a system of rituals or do's and don'ts and start to you know, uh, you know, follow things that are outside of the Word of God and start to do things that are maybe even going back to the Old Testament law and saying what the do's and don'ts were that when we know that Christ has fulfilled the law. So again, you have been severed from Christ. These people didn't lose their salvation, but they did what? They lost their walk with Him. They were already saved. And then rather than continuing to walk experientially sanctified, they started to turn to themselves and go back to the law, which, again, had been nullified, seeking to be justified by the law. And ultimately, you'd say, seeking to be justified by your good works. That's another way we could say that. And sometimes we get into a system of good works for the fact of trying to justify ourselves, trying to earn or gain or maintain our salvation. We get into that mode of operation. And we get very legalistic rather than operating in grace and mercy and love as God dealt with us. You have fallen from grace. Again, this doesn't say they lost their salvation because Paul follows up with that in the following verses, but ultimately, you've fallen from grace. You're not operating in the grace of God any longer. Now you're operating in a system of human works, human good deeds. And so even after our salvation, we've got to recognize the grace of God that is in our lives to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to be fresh and new every day, and the Word and the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit that is there uh, for us each and every day. In Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. 
You see, when we fall away from grace, in other words, when we turn away from the grace of God and the grace provisions of God and get into a system of works or legalism or even, uh, you know, a, a, a forget about the grace of the Word of God and the application of that within our lives, again, a root of bitterness can come up within our soul. And we can get angry and bitter and vengefulness and seek revenge for ourselves. And we can get all kinds of other arrogant complex of sins that start to well up within our soul. And again, springing up. And what do they do? They cause all kinds of trouble. And many be defiled. In other words, you know, you just leave awake. You know, it's like a... Well, I won't use that analogy because it's not a, you know, a good one. Well, it's a good one, but not appropriate for uh, uh, what we just saw in San Bernardino. But ultimately, you could just mow down an entire group of people. Okay? Springing up and causing many to defile because of the sin now that is in your life because you've forgotten the grace of God and you're not operating and functioning by that grace. And so we understand that the divine attitude of God is constantly waiting to pour His grace out onto you and I. Constantly waiting. And we see that in Isaiah. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 30, and let's look at verses 18 and 19. Again, back in the Old Testament. After, If you know where the book of Proverbs is, because we've studied that, but it's uh, two books after that. <clears throat> You see, in this analogy, again, you are the cup and God wants to fill you up with His grace. But if we are functioning and operating in a system of human works and human good deeds and trying to do things on our own, and we're not continuing to leave ourselves open and available to God's grace pouring into us, again, that cup that we are can't be filled by His grace. But when we do freely come to Him in faith and uh, trust and uh, rely upon Him, rather than relying upon ourselves, then God can fill that cup up called our soul. And so in uh, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18 and 19, it says, Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore He waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for Him. And then we have the example of Israel. It says, O people of Zion, inhabitants of Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will excuse me, answer you. So again, when we call out to the Lord, again, what are we doing? We're saying, Lord, come into my life. Lord, I need your help. Lord, you know, provide in this way. And then what happens? The Lord will pour his grace out onto us. But if we're keeping up that wall and, again, falling from grace and keeping that wall up between us and God and thinking, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, then, again, He can't pour that grace out onto us. And I'm talking now about post-salvation or even pre-salvation for the person who's an unbeliever. If they keep that wall up and say, I don't need God, I'm going to do this on my own and I'm a good enough person and I'm good at this and I'm going to do that and, you know, I don't need Christ in my life. As long as you keep that wall up, the grace of God for salvation doesn't pour into their cup or into their soul and then also after salvation again we need to continue to operate in faith and continue to trust and rely upon the lord and look to him because he is our loving father he is our parent and he is the one that wants to do things for us and he's provided a grace plan for us to function and operate in and as we've already noted, but just to give you some scriptures, again, when we talk about phase one of the spiritual life, we talk about salvation. Again, the day that we're saved, and then that salvation, that position that we stand in throughout the rest of our lives. We note that in Psalm chapter 103, verses 8 through 12. Romans 3.23 in chapter 4, chapter 5. Ephesians 2, eight and 9, which we'll be seeing in a week or so. And then Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. All of these, and many more, Talk about God's grace for our salvation. And again, the grace of God, and as it says here, He's waiting to be gracious on you. He's waiting. You know, He's waiting for every unbeliever that's out there in the world that has never accepted Jesus Christ. God is there waiting. And again, He's long-suffering and He's patient too. And He's just waiting and waiting and waiting for the time for them to say, Yes, Father, I believe that your Son died for my sins and I can't save myself. I am a sinner, and uh, ultimately only you can overcome my sin. God is waiting for that unbeliever. 
And then for the believer, God is waiting in your life for you to say, I'm turning it over to you, Lord. I'm giving it to you. I've tried it on my own. I've done it my own way. I'm trying to uh, you know, do it this way and that way. But now, Father, I'm turning it over to you and I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in your word and your spirit and your great plan for my life. I'm trusting in all those promises that you've given to me in scriptures. I'm trusting in you. But if you never get to the point of saying I'm trusting in you wholeheartedly and then doing it, again, the grace of God, you know, God will still be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. But once you open up your arms and say, yes, Father, come into my life experientially, then that cup that you have is filled up. And that's why we even have in the New Testament in regard to uh, giving and living in the grace life. Again, the cup runneth over. You've probably heard that phrase a number of times. You know, the grace of God just doesn't fill up the cup halfway. It's not half empty. It's not half full. Not three quarters. Not even completely full. It's overflowing. Again, the abundant grace of God. And that's why we're going to get into, uh, in just a minute, a couple of uh, quick principles in regard to the greater grace of God, as James calls it, but we also have termed it super grace. Okay? But in Romans 5.20 it says, And the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. You know, this is kind of funny when you think about it, that God gave us the law so that we would sin even more. You ever think about that? It's like, wait a minute, God doesn't, you know, cause us to sin, okay? But he said, hey, I gave the law so that sin might increase. Is God concerned about an increase of sin? Absolutely not. Why is that? Because his grace is ever more. It's infinite. It's everlasting. And you can sin your whole life, but guess what? His grace will still be there. And his grace will be waiting for you. So the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And then phase two, which is our experiential sanctification, our daily life, it says, ultimately, we understand that we have to live our lives every day in grace orientation. Again, one of those 11 problem-solving devices that we talk about. In the second aspect of our lives, after our salvation, you've got to continue to live by grace. Not only for by grace you have been saved, but by grace you should be living. The spiritual life and every aspect of our lives and I've got several examples of that in the spiritual life where we have uh, prayer and again in Hebrews chapter 4 what does it say approach the throne of grace with confidence what's the throne of grace that's where Jesus Christ is seated in the heavenly places right now he's on the throne of grace hearkens us back to the mercy seat in the tabernacle which ultimately is the cross Again, the throne of grace. You come to where Christ is. You approach that. And you don't have to approach it with fear, worry, and anxiety, even though you're a sinner. You come forward with what? Confidence. Approach the throne of grace with confidence. And it says so that ultimately he can help you in time of need. So in our prayer life, when we have that super grace life, again, James calls it greater grace, but you know, we like the term super grace as well because it's above and beyond what we can think or even imagine. Again, it's super abundant, and the grace is always there. And then in our suffering, when we go through difficulties, a time of uh, trials and tribulations, and again, we, have, you know, we do our prayer lists, and we've seen many different issues that people have within their lives, physically and spiritually uh, and emotionally. And again, they're all aspects of suffering that we are going through. And God is there, His grace is there, even when we go through that suffering. But sometimes we want to man up. You know, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to tough it out. Rather than turning it over to the Lord and, you know, giving to Him and saying, Lord, this is your problem. You know, deal with it. And take me through it. So we also understand that we learn the Word of God and we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, one of our uh, mission statements that we have up on the board there, that we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18. Again, growing and learning or a learning Bible doctrine so that we grow spiritually is also part of the grace apparatus for perception, as we call it, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
And not just that, but the application ministry of the Spirit to, to help you to learn that word and then apply it within your life. And then in 1 Peter 5, 12 and Hebrews 13, 9, we see that grace is also there for stability. Because again, as sinful creatures, we are very unstable. One minute we're up, next minute we're down. Up, down, up, down. Happy, sad, happy, sad. You know, going forward, then we're depressed. Going forward, then we're depressed. Happy, angry, happy, angry. As sinful creatures, that's how we operate. But when we go back and understand and uh, you know, receive the grace of God and apply that within our lives, we have stability. We don't have these wild fluctuations. Yeah, you're going to you know, lose it every now and again. We understand that. And the grace of God's there for rebound and recovery. But the majority of your life will be on a stable path of inner peace, happiness, and contentment without wild fluctuations of you know, uh, emotional roller coaster. And then grace is there for the Christian way of life so that we can serve one another, glorify God, worship Him. It's there for us each and every day. 2 Corinthians 1, 2 and Hebrews 12, 8. And then we also understand that it's there for divine good production so that we can produce the fruit of the Spirit. And remember, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the loom. Okay, Did you get that? Okay, It's not the fruit of you and I not a fruit of, you know, uh, Jim or John or Joe or uh, uh, Jesse or Jenny, or I'm using all the J's, you see that, okay? Uh, it's not the fruit of any one of us, it's the fruit of the Spirit, okay? It's the fruit of the Spirit, and grace is there so that we can produce divine good. But when we do produce divine good and walk in and do the good deeds that God designs us to do and do them through the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit, then it is rewardable for us and a blessing to us in time and eternity. 1 Corinthians 15.10 and 2 Corinthians 6.1. And then so we understand, and uh, I've got a few more points after this, but I'm going to get uh, and turn over to our uh, communion because uh, I've got a good message for that too that I want to share with you in regard to grace and uh, how that's come into our lives. But grace and giving. Again, we always have to recognize that our giving, whether it be of our time, our talent, or our treasure, it's always by the grace of God that we should be giving. And we have to recognize that God has blessed us. You live in the United States of America. You are blessed more than 80, 90 percent of the rest of the world, even if you're at the lowest of low in our economic uh, scale in this country. Again, God has blessed us in a fantastic way. But if we take those blessings and start to use them solely for ourselves and we start to hoard those or you know, keep them back rather than being of a giving nature, again, the grace of God doesn't continue to pour within our lives. But when we do have the grace of God and uh, the heart within our lives, again, the grace of God is there within our lives. Again, I received, you know, I talked about Brad and Mary Ellen, and, you know, they shared their grace uh, with me and uh, with my wife, and they're gracing us out by bringing us on a trip uh, starting, you know, next weekend that I talked about. Fantastic blessing, and I thank them. But, you know, we had, uh, uh, you know, Donna and uh, uh, Debbie, uh, you know, cut together, and they gave me little honey jars, because, you know, I have a honey hive, and I collect, or honey bees, and I have honey from that. And they gave me some jars, okay? They just gave, said, here, it's yours, okay? Yours to use. Again, they took from their means and, again, gave grace. And again, I just throw these examples out. They're both blessings. They're both blessings to me, but they're both by the grace of God. God gave them means. Now they're able to bless others with the means that they have. And again, we have to have a grace mentality. And when we have the super grace life, it doesn't mean we're going to have a million dollars to give, but it's, we're going to have a heart to give. And we give of whatever we can. And God will continue to bless us and uh, you know, su uh, supply for us. And as we do give, again, the scriptures are very clear. You know, God loves a cheerful giver, but also God sees the giver. And the more that somebody gives, the more God will continue to bless them within their lives. And again, the more you have a heart of giving, the more God is going to provide you the means to be able to give of your time, your talent, and or your treasure. God's going to give you the means. And so again, we have to function in that way when we do give and not be like, you know, oh, you know here's the dollar for the, I'm just a, the example, here's the dollar for the offering plate. Oh, I don't want to do it. Oh, okay, I did it. Oh. 
That's not giving. That's not grace giving, okay? Grace giving is, the Lord gave me this dollar. It's just a piece of paper. Here. <laughs> Put it in the offering plate. Not a big deal. Not an issue. And again, when we give of what God has given to us, and we give in that free state, rather than being all caught up in what we're doing and how we're doing it and you know, what, what we're going to get and what we're not going to get, etc. Again, the grace of God is not functioning within our lives. So again, God has blessed us materialistically, and with those things, you know, we have to have that same grace orientation and give back. And when we do give, it's a meaningful aspect of the priestly profession that we have been given. We are royal priests, we're royal ambassadors, and part of our priesthood is giving. And it's also called what? A sacrifice. As the priests during the age of Israel, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, they would officiate over sacrifices for the people. And again, their, their officiating was a fantastic ministry that they have to represent who and what Jesus Christ was. And as they officiated over all those sacrifices, with all those different animals, with all the blood that was shed and spilled, it all pointed to the person of Jesus Christ and His work upon the cross. And they had the honor of officiating over that, serving God in that sacrifice, which also did what? Covered the people. Covered the people of their sin until Christ would come. And as a priest, they had the high responsibility and privilege of being able to officiate over sacrifice. And so you as a believer priest in your giving each and every day, it's the same aspect of the high privilege you have to give, to help, to provide for others and quote-unquote cover them as well. And the more that you give, the more you're bringing Christ into their lives. And the more that you are covering their lives as well with God's grace, kindness, goodness, love, and mercy. And you're bringing that to them. So again, you know, it's part of our profession. Let's be givers, you know. Let's be givers and give of whatever we can. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, both chapters speak of this uh, intently. And then also Philippians chapter 4 verses 14 and 18 speak to that as well. So, you know, when we go forward in the spiritual life, I'm going to skip over a couple of those. Again, our Lord commands us in Psalm 34, 14. He says, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You see, when you function in goodness and peace and you're seeking these things, okay, you're functioning and operating in the grace of God. And as it says, pursue it. And these, 1 Peter 3.11 also reiterates this passage. We're going to show you a couple of others. But the point is, pursue the grace of God. You see, God doesn't want us just to sit back and be willy-nilly about, oh, I'm going to receive the grace, okay? Pursue it. Go after it. Chase the grace of God. Seek it out. How do you do that? Through your prayer, by asking, seeking the Word, and then applying the Word on a consistent basis through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Pursue these things, especially in your divine good production that, that you are producing. Pursue it. Romans 14, 19, So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. That's all about grace. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And again, that's all wrapped up in the word grace. All these things are part of God's grace towards you and now how we should be operating in grace back towards God and then towards others as well. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And this one's even, even better because it's talking about within the family of God. You know? Yeah, we have grace to show those who are outside the family of God, but within the family of God. Again, even more so, show your grace towards one another. Show your love towards one another. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, without which no one will see the Lord. And again, seek that in other people. Again, that's now going out and giving that gospel message and doing it through your actions and through your words. And by being gracious to people in your life, 
you are showing the Christ-like nature. You're showing who and what God is. You're being an ambassador for God and for Christ. And then giving an opportunity to follow that up with the gospel message itself to hopefully lead them to salvation. But remember, you know, some pe- people are the sowers, other people are the reapers. In other words, some people, you know, start the Word of God in somebody's life, and then another person will come along and see the results of that and see them come to faith. Don't worry about whether you see the results or not. Just give and be gracious. So pursue it with all men. All right, so uh, let's uh, end there this morning and because uh, I do want to get into uh, a very interesting topic that I prepared for our communion lesson uh, that I would like to share with you. So uh, let's just pray right now for this portion of our service. Father, we thank you for... Uh, giving us your word this morning and uh, helping us to understand even better the grace that you have uh, richly poured out onto us and desire to pour pour out onto us and help us to be better recipients of that grace. Open up our hearts to receive your grace, Father, and then also to be workers of grace here in this life. Give of our time, our talent, and our treasure graciously so that others are served, you are glorified, and many can be saved. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have together this morning, and we ask that you bless us in the closing portions as we celebrate uh, the communion this morning. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so thank you very much uh, for that portion of our service. And as I said, uh, we're going to partake of a communion right now. And uh, as we uh, prepare for that, let's have the two ushers come forward. And I've got a um, a nice video that I wanted to share with you while we pass out the communion elements. that I will get up right now. All right, so uh, let's just uh, pray for this portion of our service. Father, we thank you for this time to celebrate the bread and the wine of your Son, Jesus Christ, and giving us a great picture of what he had accomplished for us on the cross. And Father, we ask that you help us to concentrate on the words uh, that we're about to hear this morning in song and then also in the message so that ultimately we come closer and uh, develop even a a greater appreciation for what your Son, Jesus Christ, and you have done for us. In your Son's precious name we pray. Amen. All right, let me get this going. Again.
nice message in regard to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for us on the cross and again how our attitude should be towards him and uh, as uh, we go through the communion this morning I wanted to uh, share with you uh, one aspect of the Old Testament that gives us a great picture of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that is the aspect of the scapegoat and I don't know if you're familiar with this story but if you like uh, very carefully try not to spill uh, but let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. And in uh, Leviticus chapter 16, it talks about the sacrifice that they were commanded to make, and especially the high priest of Israel, for the people of Israel on the Day of Atonement. So Yom uh, Kippur, as we uh, talk about that, but the Day of Atonement is, that's been given to us, there was a unique sacrifice that they would commit on that day, and ultimately it included what we now call the scapegoat, or what the Bible even calls the scapegoat, but ultimately there were two goats involved in this sacrifice. And even though there are two goats involved, it's really one sacrifice in total that's in view, and they both speak of the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go through and read a little bit of that, and there's a couple of interesting little tidbits that we see within this passage. And then when we see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, here, when he came and uh, went through his trials, especially before Pontius Pilate, we see some very interesting analogy that the Father displayed publicly through Jesus Christ to also give us this representation of Him being our scapegoat. And so I wanted to share that with you as we celebrate our communion this morning to have a, a greater understanding of who our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is and what He has done for us. Now, in uh, Leviticus chapter 16, let's jump down to verse 5, because here it talks about the offerings. And it says, and he, talking about Aaron, who was the high priest at that time, and he shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Now, what's interesting about the sin offering is, the, the, is that that really can guess what that really means, but it represents Jesus Christ taking on our sins. And ultimately, him removing our sins from us because it now has been transferred to him. And then the burnt offerings, when we talk about those, the burnt offerings are an analogy of us being drawn to God. You see, the burnt offering was what we would give in our sacrifice, or what the Israelites would give in their sacrifice, to provide a sacrifice on the altar. And what they would do is they'd have to bring something to the altar. And ultimately, it talks about us bringing ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not a work that we have to do for our salvation, but we have to bring ourselves to Him. And when we, I say bring ourselves to Him, ultimately, how do we do that? By receiving everything that He has done for us. Okay? So when they talk about bringing the burnt offering, it talks about their acceptance of what God has done for them and them coming to it. All right? So it says, Then Aaron shall offer the bull... For the sin offering, which is for himself, so he had his own offering, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And Aaron, and Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And this is the word that we have. So there's two goats. One is going to be offered up to the Lord, and that's going to go on the altar of sacrifice. The other will be the scapegoat. And the lots were interesting because, again, it talks about the Holy Spirit as they would cast lots. Again, the Holy Spirit and God knew from eternity past which one would be for the Lord and which one would be the scapegoat. And again, it talks about divine providence and God knowing. All right, then in verse 9, uh, verse 9, it says, Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell, and make it a sin offering. Okay, It says, But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord, but yet to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which he himself, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, uh, which is for himself. And he shall take a fire pan full of coals of the fire, and upon the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. 
and he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that, that is on the ark of the testimony, lest he die. It says, Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Now, just real quick, the seven times talks about spiritual perfection. So again, the spiritual perfection of uh, Christ's sacrifice for all of our sins being represented in that blood and the sprinkling of it. And the east side is interesting as well. And really, that's an analogy of what? The second coming of our Lord. Because the scripture tells us that the Lord is going to come down to Jerusalem and in his second advent he's going to enter through the east gate. And that's the prophecy that's been given to us. That will happen by our Lord. And so here, even in the sacrifice, not only are we talking about the first advent, and Steve's going to talk about this next Sunday, not only is he talking about the first advent, but we're seeing the second advent of our Lord in view when he had to sprinkle the blood on the east side as well, talking about his second coming. And again, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, it all comes together for you. In verse 15, it says, Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. You see, the goat, the two, the two goats are for the people. Aaron did his own for his own sins in his household, but now the goat represented all the people. Okay? It says, And bring the blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. So seven times, spiritual perfection, but also on the east side, second coming. It says, And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel, and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of the meeting, which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. So again, covering their sins and because of their sins. It says, When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat and put it on the th horns of the altar on all sides. And again, horns talk about strength. The altar really represents uh, the, the cross sacrifice as well. And then all four, the four horns that were pointing in, four directions, north, south, east, and west, representing covering for all the people. Okay? It says, And with his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it from the impurities of the sons of Israel. Uh, uh, sons of Israel consecrate it. All right? And from the impurities of the sons of Israel consecrate it. Okay? So, again, another demonstration of the covering of their sins through this blood. Then in verse 20, when he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of the meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities, we would say sins, of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. There's another guy involved here. It's very interesting. You can see that in just a minute. But uh, typically in the sacrifice, the head of the household would come and lay his head or hand on the head of the animal that was sacrificed, and then they would sacrifice. They'd kill that animal and sacrifice it. And ultimately, that was a representation of transferring of sin to that animal, and then the sin gave its life for that family. Here we see the high priest now doing it for the whole congregation, for all the people, and he's laying both hands, not just one hand, but now both hands are kind of a doubling down to make sure we get them all there, okay? And again, a transference of the sin from the people down into that animal. All right, so that's the laying on. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures in a minute. It says, And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments with which, uh, which he put on, 
when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there and shall bathe his body with water in the holy place and put on his clothes and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself for the people. You see the washing, the bathing, that's the representation of what we receive when uh, we receive Christ, that we've been washed and bathed, cleansed of our sins. It says in verse 25, Then he shall offer up in, uh, in, uh, in smoke the fat of the sin offering on the altar. And the one who released the goat as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Then afterwards he shall come into the camp. And then it says, But the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be taken outside the camp, and they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuge in fire. Then the one who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Then afterwards uh, he shall come into the camp. Now, it's very interesting that once they would commit the sacrifices and the ones that were killed, and then they would you know, take the pieces and burn them on the altar, they would take what? The skins and the hides, and they'd take it out to the dump, the refuge dump, and they'd burn it outside the camp. Okay? Again, another aspect of the removal of sin, the leftover garbage. And you know what they used to call that fire out there? They called it Gehenna which is another word for hell, or translated as hell as well. So it gave them a picture, a representation of hell. And as we know in the book of Revelation, that death and sin and all of those who ultimately reject Jesus Christ and remain in their sin, they're getting thrown to where? Gehenna, into hell. So all kinds of analogy uh, that we see here. Let me give you a couple of pictures. Again, uh, you see the high priest and laying his two hands on the head of the goat, and the transference of sin. He was representing the people, all the people, just as Jesus Christ. We are priests in the family of God, but Jesus Christ is what? Our high priest. And he took on our sins, okay? And officiated over our sins. Here's a, kind of another representation of that in picture. The high priest, again, over the goat. And then you see them getting ready here to release that goat out onto the wilderness. Now, what's interesting about the scapegoat is it wasn't just that he got to go free. You know, we, we talk about that sometimes, and we think of, oh, you know, the scapegoat representing us to go free of our sin. No, this scapegoat represented sin, and the sin was what? Carried away into, as it said, the wilderness. And that represents God removing our sins and then just throwing it into the ocean, as we would say. And as Scripture tells us, again, the removal of our sin far away. You see, that's what the scapegoat does, the removal of our sin. So not only do we have the altar sacrifice that talks about our drawing near to God, but we have the goat sin offering that goes away and takes our sin away as Jesus Christ took our sin and removed it completely away from us. And so again, you see that man that also had to officiate over that and getting that goat out of the camp. Because if you just let the goat go at the entrance of the camp, it'd probably wander right back into the camp. And it'd be with everybody else, and the sin would remain amongst the people. So this guy had to make sure that the sin was removed, and the sin was taken out, and it was taken outside the camp. And so again, we see another depiction of that, and uh, again, the removal of that goat, and then again, casting it out to the wilderness so that it's away from the people, and sin is completely removed. And so here's a nice little cartoon, again, the beast of burden, as we would call it. Again, that's a mule, but in this case, the goat carrying our sin and taking it out into the wilderness, taking it away from us, far removed from where we are. And as I said, both of these, even though they're two animals and they went in two different directions, they both speak of what Jesus Christ did for us. Not only did he suffer and die as we celebrate the bread of Jesus Christ and the physical suffering and torture that he went through, but he also removed our sin as we represent in this cup that we now drink. You see the scapegoats right here. You're about to partake of the scapegoat, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and sin is far removed, and we have everlasting life. And so, when we look at Jesus Christ, there's a, another interesting analogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that happened when he was before Pontius Pilate. 
And we see in Matthew 27, 16 and 11, and John chapter 18, verse 14. And John 18, 14 is very interesting because the high priest of Israel, during the time that they arrested Jesus Christ and then put him through these trials, the high priest, he said it back in John 11, he says it again here in John 18, isn't it expedient for the people for one person to die so that we all can live? So the high priest himself said it's better for this one guy to die so that we could all live. He was prophesizing what Jesus Christ would do, even though he rejected him as the Savior and the Messiah and rejected him as the scapegoat. But then we see in Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through 16, and uh, you can read this on your own. I won't go through and read this now, but we see Pontius Pilate, and again, the passion of the Christ depicted here. And we see Jesus on one side. We see Barabbas on the other. And in a way, this too represents that. Barabbas was what? He was a criminal. He had his sin of his own. He represents the people. Okay? He represents you and I. And even though he had sin of his own, guess what? They let him go free. And wasn't it interesting that the Romans had a custom with the Jews during uh, this, this wasn't the, the Feast of Atonement. Again, this was the Feast of Passover. But they had a custom with the Jews when Christ would go to the cross to release one prisoner, let one go while the other remained. Isn't that interesting? And also, what did we see about Aaron? after he officiated over the sacrifice. He washed himself up. What do we see about the guy who led the scapegoat out of the city? What did he have to do? Wash himself up. When they let Barabbas go, you represent the people. You go free. Your sins are paid for. Your sins are covered. But yet, he, what did he do? He said, Jesus Christ, you will be crucified because the people cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And what did Pontius Pilate do? He washed his hands. So we almost see Pontius Pilate as being that man that led the scapegoat out of the city. And he washed himself up and cleansed himself as a result of the judgment that he brought down. And then Jesus Christ, did he get crucified inside of Jerusalem? No, he, they dragged him outside the city. And they put him on Calvary and upon the cross. And there he paid for the sins of the world. And what happened when that body was, you know, was discarded? They took it down from the cross and they put it in a tomb outside the city still. And so again, when we see the carcass of those animals that were sacrificed and they were taken outside to be burned and to be done away with, we see the body of Jesus Christ being uh, fulfilled and done away with and it too being removed outside the city because sin had been paid for. So in the scapegoat, not only do we see Jesus Christ in the burnt offering and what he did for us on the cross, again, as we represent that through the bread that we partake and the body that he suffered and the body that was then discarded afterwards. And the body that also had to experience that uh, separation from the Father, that suffering that he endured, which is also what the unbeliever will endure when they are thrown into Gehenna, we see Jesus Christ having taken that on in his body and suffering that torture and separation. And we see that in the body of Jesus Christ. And so we see him as that first scapegoat that was put upon the altar and totally destroyed. But yet it did what? It draws us near to God. It reconciled us. It propitiated God. It conciliated us with God. And then it did also pardon us from our sin. And so when we see Barabbas there, he was pardoned of his sin. He represented us and he was able to go free as you and I now go free. And so we eat the bread. Let's now partake of the bread of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which represents that body that, again, was sacrificed for us so that we could have everlasting life. Let us eat the bread in thanksgiving. And now we take the cup, and again, the, tub, the cup, as they had the two goats. So again, one went to the altar, the other took the sins far, far away. We see that it was the blood of Jesus Christ. Again, the, 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 uh, the spiritual representation of blood, where he paid the penalty for our sins upon the cross and suffered that spiritual death as was removed from God the Father for that time. 
And all of our sins were taken from us and put on him. And he was led outside the city and said, get out of here, go away. Jesus Christ took our sins far from us. And we never have to pay for our sins. We never have to overcome our sins or do anything for it. He did it all for us. And when we drink the cup of Jesus Christ, it represents that spiritual sacrifice that he endured, the second part of the scapegoat or the goat sacrifice. Now the scapegoat that has removed our sins far from us so that we too could have everlasting life. And so let us give thanks to God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ for suffering and taking our sin away so that we would have eternal life. All right, let's just bow our heads now in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of praise and worship in your Son, Jesus Christ, and all that he has done for us and continues to do for us. And Father, we can't thank you enough for all the blessings that you have provided for us. And we ask that you continue to pour out your, cup of, uh, your grace into our cup so that we may continue to walk in glorification of you. And Father, we also pray for the Rourke family this morning as they're returning home from their uh, funeral service and uh, loss of uh, their loved one, and we ask that you give them blessings on their way home as well. So, Father, we thank you, and we ask that you be with us in the closing portions of our service this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And I forgot my big finish. One cross, three nails equals what? Forgiven. Forgot the big finish. All right. But in any case, uh, you understand all of that and uh, know what our Lord did for us on the cross. So uh, let's now prepare to uh, partake of an offering. Uh, I'll show this slide some other time too. All right. But in any case, uh, now is our time where we partake of an offering and uh, now is our time to operate by the grace of God to uh, give to our local assembly to meet the needs that we uh, currently have. And uh, now is our time to give graciously. And I know it's uh, always difficult, uh, or for some, because they spend too much money during the Christmas season, but we have to remember to uh, give to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ first and foremost and give to Him abundantly uh, so that He can continue to be proclaimed. So let's just pray for our offering. Father, we thank You for this time to give to You. We ask that You accept all that we give as uh, gracious offerings unto You, knowing that You have provided us all the uh, material things that we need so that we could offer up these sacrifices to You. We ask that you utilize these things to proclaim your word in the in your name of your son, Jesus Christ, from this local assembly far and wide. In Christ's precious name, amen. And if Barry could pass the offering. <laughs>